his title? What is treasure? What is title? What is treasure? What is reputation's care? If you lead a life of pleasure, who's to worry who or where? As a poet, Robert Burns is famous for his simplicity, his honesty, his human empathy. But actually, at the same time, he has massive sophistication as an artist. The Jolly Beggars gives evidence of the most incredibly sophisticated literary mind. It's a massive barbaric yawp of a poem, going right to the heart of pub culture, of everyday life. Burns was a master at getting in among all that, singing songs about a life that he loved to live himself and that he wanted to celebrate. A fig for those, a fig for those by law protected. Liberties are, Liberties are glorious feast. Courts for cowards, Courts for cowards were erected. Churches built, Churches built to please the priest. Bond showed his true colours in these uncompromising lines. He didn't hide the fact that he was a radical and a freedom lover. In fact, he revelled in it. Even if that put him at odds with the traditional Ayrshire community that he lived in. Polemical divinity about this time was putting the country half mad. And I, ambitious of shining in conversation parties on Sundays, between sermons, at funerals, used a few years afterwards to puzzle Calvinists with so much heat and indiscretion that I raised a hue and cry of heresy against me. Today, Mockland Parish is a warm and welcoming place. But back then, it was where the increasingly notorious young poet most frequently clashed with Mockland's moral guardians. In the days of Robert Burns, drunkenness, Sabbath-breaking, non-attendance at worship, fornication and adultery were particularly frowned upon. And often in those days, fornicators, known fornicators at least, answer, had to come out in front of the congregation and sit in a special penitent seat, the, the cutty stool. This was the stool of repentance, a seat set apart in church on which sinners had to appear before the worshipping congregation to confess their waywardness and to receive the public rebuke of the minister. The idea was that the local congregation was controlled through shame, but it didn't always work. When Burns first did penitence on the cutty stool, seven other fornicators sat beside him. Burns was always in two minds about religion. On the one hand, he believed in God, but on the other, he felt that church hypocrisy was a blight on the Scotland of his day. Here lies the remains of Willie Fisher, who was an elder of the Mocklin Kirk, and he became the subject of one of the most scabrous, comical and wonderful satires on religious hypocrisy in any language. That poem is Holy Willie's Prayer. O oh Lord, your stream thou kens we make, I pardon, I sincerely beg, and may it ne'er be a living plate to my dishonour, and I'll ne'er lift a lawless leg again upon her. Besides, the poem takes the form of a confessional prayer in which Holy Willie makes excuses for his own sins, the very same sins that as an elder of the Kirk he would have condemned in others. But Lord, that Friday I was fu when I came near her, or else thou kens thy servant true would near his theatre. Love poet, scathing satirist, political radical, it all fed Robert Burns' local reputation, but he still lacked an aim in life. But all that was about to change. This is Mosgiel Farm in Mocklin in Ayrshire, the place where Burns moved with his entire family in the 1780s. He worked hard here as a farmer on tough ground, but he also wrote his greatest work here, the kinds of poems that would change not only the course of Scottish literature, but world literature as well. After a day labouring out in the fields, Burns would come back to this farmhouse to write. It continues as a working farm to this day. I entered on this farm with a full resolution. Come go to, I will be wise. 
I read farming books, I calculated crops, I attended markets. Hello, Mr. Hi. Wiley. Hi, you. Good to see you. Are you well? Hi. How long have you lived here at Moscow? Uh, all my days. And since you were a, a baby, you yes. were born in these parts? 87 years next week. 87 next week. <laughs> and have your people always lived here about? I've lived here since the 1806. So just not long yeah. after Burns' is Or death. five years after Burns went out. And you've got some photographs we could look at that show mm. the past of your family here. Just the family, I. Can you think, Mr Wiley, what the birthdays are some of these people in the photographs, the older ones would have been... Um, what kind of year would they be born, this fellow, for instance? I think my grandfather was born in 1848, I think. Mm -hmm. And his grandfather definitely no burned. Mm -hmm. the, the great grandmothers of some of these people in this picture could conceivably have been girlfriends of Burns, do you know think? Well, they had every chance. They seemed to go to every last year in Boston. <laughs> they were local. <laughs> if they attended dances, they would have been in the crossfire. Yeah, I can. Burns father is said to have cast doubt from his deathbed and whether his aimless son Robert would succeed in life. But here at Mosgill Farm, in the year after his father's death, Burns wrote poetry like never before. He gave life to some of his greatest work. Poems such as To a Mountain Daisy, Scotch Drink, The Twa Dugs. In that year, as he tried to make a success of his farm and of his life, it seemed like the smallest of things could inspire him. Something happened in this field. It was a cold, wet November day, and Robert Burns came out into the field to what the plough as usual. And whilst doing so, he accidentally turned up a mouse's nest, and that gave rise to one of the most beautiful, most empathetic poems in any language, a political poem to a mouse. We sleek it, cuirn timorous beastie. Oh, what a panics in thy breastie. Thou needna start a wars a hasty with bicker and brattle. I would be late to run and chase thee with murder and pato. I'm truly sorry that man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earth born companion and fellow mortal. Did the ploughed up mouse's nest stir up Bonzo's own painful memories? Had he done to a tiny field mouse what landlords had threatened to do to him and his family? It certainly inspired him to create one of the most empathetic poems ever. In line after line, he invited the world to feel the pulse of universal fellowship with that one insignificant animal. To understand as he did, that life was a struggle against loss, that in the midst of living, we are also dying. Towards the end of the poem, he even longed to be like the mouse, to have no past to regret, nor any future to fear. Still, thou art blessed compared with me, the present only toucheth thee, but oh, I backward cast my ye on prospects drear, and forward, Though I can see, I guess in fear. It's hard to think of many poets who had Burns' intimate sympathy for the natural environment, for animals and for the life of nature. But actually, farm work itself was something Burns hated. The long, laborious days in the rain and the snow it was too much for him. What he really yearned for was human company, the life of the town. By 1785, Burns had an illegitimate child on the way with a local girl called Betsy Payton. And in nearby Mochlin, his infamy was growing. 
but many of the town's women caught his eye, and he would turn on the charm to catch theirs, both in person and in rhyme. 